Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Sunday Evening Lecture Series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. Well, uh, welcome everyone to the Library Sunday Speaker Series. We're very happy that you've come and we're really happy that King Kim Bingham is our speaker today. He's going to talk about his father, Hiram Bingham IV, who risked his personal safety and his profession, professional life to do something that he knew he had to do because it was the right thing to do. Working as a vice counsel in Marseille, he defied a State Department prohibition that would have denied visas to thousands of desperate, mostly Jewish refugees who were trying to leave Vichy, France at the beginning of the Holocaust. So he provided them documentation. He issued special visas. I'm being told to speak up. <laughs> uh, he hid people in his house. He worked with the French underground to smuggle people out of the country. And in doing this, he saved over 2,000 lives. Uh, Kim has written about the work of his father and, all of, and also about his own efforts to commemorate his father uh, on a U.S. postage stamp. Uh, he's written about it in his wonderful book, Courageous Descent, which will be on sale after the talk. Now, I realize that many of you know Kim Bingham, but what you might not know is that this man sitting right here has remarkable DNA. Uh, his father, Hiram Bingham IV, of course, and then his grandfather, Hiram Bingham III, was an explorer who uh, stumbled across the Inca ruins in Machu Picchu in Peru and later led the excavation there. He went on to become governor of Connecticut, the U.S. senator from Connecticut, and he taught at Yale. Now, Kim's you can help me get this straight. Your great-grandfather and your great-great-grandfather, Hiram Bingham II and Hiram Bingham I, were Protestant missionaries in Hawaii. And Hiram Bingham I was a key player in developing the spelling system for the Hawaiian language. And Hiram Bingham II actually translated the Bible into the language of the Gilbert Islands. And I'm not quite finished. Uh, on his mother's side, uh, his great-great-grandfather was Charles Tiffany, who founded Tiffany and & Company, and his great-great-grand-uncle was Louis Tiffany, who designed that beautiful Tiffany stained glass. Now, Kim's no slouch himself. <laughs> he, uh, he served with distinction for 37 years, um, and it's written in the program here, as a federal attorney for the Office of the General Counsel for Immigration and Naturalization Service. Uh, so many more things, it's in the program. But even in retirement, Kim is still working to develop proposals that would make our immigration system fairer and safer. So Kim, I could hardly wait to hear what you have to say. Well, welcome for our speaker. Southern part of France. 
thousands line up outside of the United States consulate in hopes of obtaining documents that will allow them to leave France. The U.S., which has not yet entered the war, is a neutral nation. American officials at the consulate are ordered by their superiors at the State Department to do nothing to help those trying to escape the Nazis. One official, Hiram Bingham IV, known as Harry, refuses to follow those orders. Bingham, the son of a famous explorer and U.S. Senator, the great-grandson of the founder of Tiffany and Company, could not stand idly by. Harry actually saw the long lines of desperate refugees outside of his window at the consulate, so he knew that action was necessary, regardless of policy. That policy was set by Breckenridge Long, Assistant Secretary of State, who was the head of the Special War Problems Division and an intimate of President Roosevelt. Long was a well-known anti-Semite who was opposed to any immigration from Europe to the U.S. In a State Department memo, Long told subordinates that they could stop refugees from coming to the U.S. from Marseille <coughs> and other places, quote, by simply advising our consuls to put every obstacle in the way which would postpone and postpone and postpone the granting of the visas. Vichy French officials were under orders by the Nazis to hold refugees until German intelligence could investigate them. Without exit visas, these refugees, the majority of them Jews, were forced into internment camps. Harry Bingham began issuing documents that became a lifeline to those who had no legal means of obtaining an exit visa to a neutral country. He would issue affidavits in lieu of passports. Now these were important documents to help people to escape and obtain other visas. One of the first people he helped was the respected author, Leon Feuchtwanger, who was being held in a Vichy detention center. Leon Feuchtwanger was high up on, on Hitler's most wanted list for having written anti-Nazi novels. And then he had him stay in his home for about six weeks with his wife, Marta. The decision to hide for Funker was one that led to strong disagreements with the superiors at the U.S. consulate. He would argue with his boss, and that was picked up by the author who was hiding in his villa. He could hear him shouting on the phone to people in the embassy. After sheltering him in his home, the diplomat then put together an escape plan for the novelist and his wife which enabled them to make their way to the U.S. Harry Bingham soon began working with journalist Barry and Fry, who ran the Emergency Rescue Committee, an international effort created to help those trying to flee the Nazis. He came from the Emergency Rescue Committee from New York City with a list of uh, prominent people, intellectuals and uh, artists, and they, he helped him to locate some of those and help him to escape. One of those individuals was the famed artist Mark Chagall, who Harry Bingham convinced to accept an exit visa and flee to the U.S. The diplomat also aided political theorist Hannah Arendt and the artist Max Ernst. And he gave shelter in his home to the author Heinrich Mann, the elder brother of the famed novelist Thomas Mann, but it was not only the prominent who were saved by Harry Bingham. What I, I never knew about my father was that he had issued so many visas to people who were not so famous. And um, his compassion and love of humanity was behind it. In a year's time, Harry Bingham helped more than 2,500 refugees escape the Nazis. Those efforts eventually led to his losing his position in Marseille. He was in charge of issuing visas, but then at one point they dismissed him from that supervisory capacity. And um, eventually he wound up being sent to Lisbon and then down to Buenos Aires. In 1945, Harry Bingham resigned from the Foreign Service. His career at a dead end. His decision to issue documents and exit visas in opposition to State Department policies 
had ended any hopes he had of advancing in his career. He returned to the family farm in Salem, Connecticut, and with his wife Rose raised their 11 children. He tried several business ideas that did not succeed and lived off an inheritance from his father while his wife taught. His children knew little, if anything, about his wartime work. And then, after he died in 1988, one of his sons found documents that outlined his activities in Marseille. The children took it upon themselves to let the world know what their father had done. In 1998, because of their efforts, Harry Bingham and 10 other diplomats were honored by Yad Vashem, Israel's National Holocaust Memorial, for having saved more than 200,000 Jews during the war. And in 2006, the U.S. Postal Service issued a Hiram Bingham IV commemorative stamp. The man who was drummed out of his government job for following his conscience was now being honored by the U.S. government for his wartime heroism. While all of the honors mean a lot to Robert Bingham and his siblings, few things mean more than the letter he received from a woman named Ellie Sherman. Of the three in my family your father saved, I am the last one alive, and I write this with trembling fingers and many a tear. Your father provided us with documents because we no longer had held citizenship in, in any country, and therefore had no papers. I still have the document. We cannot honor him enough. He saved my mother, my sister, and me. Without him, we would not have been able to avoid the concentration camp to which we were assigned two days later, Ellie Sherman. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming today. I'm grateful for Japan Weaming, Kate Randolph, Susan Martin, and Mikhail, Mikhail Paul for helping out today in this, this opportunity. I'm grateful to you for allowing me to speak about my father. He was his family and friends called him Harry. He was a humble religious man whom I loved and with whom my ten brothers and sisters and I happily grew up in Salem, Connecticut for 45 years until he died peacefully at home in 1988 at the age of 84. He had a strong moral compass when I was six years old, he taught us children a lesson on honesty that I never forgot. He used to go to the, we used to go to the family beach in Waterford. One day I walked with my older brothers to the nearby Ocean Beach Park and easily entered from the beach without paying the three cent pedestrian fee. We rode the bumping cars, the octopus, and played miniature golf, which we did pay for. When we returned to our family beach, my father discovered that we hadn't paid the three cent fee, and he was enraged. He scolded us boys and said we weren't worth three cents. <laughs> this had a big impact on me as a six-year-old. But Harry quickly calmed down and returned to his gentle ways. I also learned another side of him, his courage, when he was only 10 years old in 1913. While riding a school bus in New Haven, he noticed a big student bullying a smaller one on the bus. 
Harry said to the bully, don't do that. The bully, who was much larger than Harry, said, well, what are you going to do about it? Harry then got off the bus at the same stop as the bully. My father always wore thick glasses that made him look like a sage old owl. <laughs> he slowly took off his glasses and placed them in his pocket. This frightened the bully so much so that he ran away. <laughs> as we shall see, Harry courageously defied his superior's restrictive immigration policies in 1940 to 41 by quietly rescuing refugees who were fleeing from Hitler. Harry attended Grotten School in Massachusetts and graduated from Yale in 1925. And for a time he attended Harvard Law School. After receiving a high grade on the Foreign Service exam in 1927, he decided to enter the Foreign Service. During a span of 18 years, he served in Japan, China, Poland, England, France, Portugal, and Argentina. I was born in Buenos Aires. He resigned from the Foreign Service in 1945 under unhappy circumstances. When he was repeatedly denied promotions, he returned to our ancestral home in Salem, where he and his beautiful wife, Rose, raised us 11 children. My father did not boast, but he always spoke highly of his beloved wife, Rose, for 50 years, and their children. Rose and Harry taught us that there is a spark of divinity in every human being and that we should treat others with compassion and live by the golden rule. As the film showed, today Harry is officially recognized as a World War II rescuer who helped save many Jews and others fleeing from Hitler while serving in <coughs> Marseille, France. On May 30, 2006, the U.S. Postal <coughs> Service issued the Hiram Bingham stamp, labeling him a distinguished American dip diplomat. And he had five other diplomats uh, also honored on a six-stamp set in 2006. The late Congressman Tom Lantos who was then the sole Holocaust survivor in Congress, spoke at Harry's stamp celebration in the U.S. Capitol on May 24, 2006. He said, Hiram Bingham's courage is an inspiration to us all. In an age when too many chose to ignore the plight of the persecuted, he became directly engaged in their cause in, with significant risk to himself. Former Senator Joseph Lieberman spoke, as we gather today to honor him, we must continue to tell his remarkable story, to live by the example set by this honorable and righteous man. My father should be remembered as Hiram Bingham IV, because he grew up in the shadow of the three previous Hiram Binghams who had led extraordinary lives. He, he later became a Hiram III. We can say a little more about Hiram III, my, my father's father. He, he became a pioneer aviator in the U.S. Air Service after he discovered Machu Picchu. D during the First World War in 1917, he commanded the Allies' largest air base in Europe. The French government awarded him the Order of the Black Star for his service in France in World War I. He eventually did become governor and senator from Connecticut. My father, Hiram Harry Bingham IV, left 
law school to join the Foreign Service. Throughout his life, he lived by the motto, give the best that you have to the best that you know. Rather than saving souls like his missionary ancestors, the best that he knew was during the nightmare of the Holocaust was to save lives. While stationed in Marseille during 1940 to 41, Harry defied orders from his superiors and issued as many visas as he could. He also helped renowned Jewish artists and intellectuals, as we heard already, Leon Feuchtpanger, Mark Chagall, Anna Arendt, Otto Meyer, and, 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 and others. While other outposts in France refused to issue visas, refugees made their way to Marseille, seeking to reach Harry Bingham for one last chance to live. In mid-1940, Harry Bingham and his colleague Miles Standish helped anti-Nazi author Leon Feuchtwanger escape from the Nîmes detention camp in France. Near the camp swimming hole, the author was spirited into their diplomatic car and quickly disguised as a woman with a shawl and driven past the camp guards to Bingham's villa in Marseille. Harry then hid his, the author and his wife, as we learned, for six weeks. Harry provided the author a false visa with the name Wet Cheek. He also stuffed Marcus's backpack with cartons of camel cigarettes with instructions for her to toss the cartons under the table under the noses of the Spanish border guards. She later wrote that they grabbed up the cartons and quickly let her through. <laughs> Marta's memory says, memoir says, Harry's plan had worked like a charm and after passing the guards, she never ran down a mountain so fast. <laughs> the well-known righteous Gentiles wait still and Marta sharp who worked closely with Bingham, bravely escorted the Feuchtwangers over the mountains. According to the U.S. Holocaust Museum, Eleanor Roosevelt sent the Sharks to Marseille to assist the refugee couple. About six years ago, my sister Abigail Bingham Endicott and her husband Bill found a letter in our family farmhouse in Salem, signed by Wet Cheek. <laughs> the author had written to Harry in September 1940 from aboard the SS Excalibur while heading to New York City. The letter thanked Harry for his assistance and good company while he was hiding in his villa. My sister also found a letter to Harry from Martha Sharp dated November 26, 1940, thanking Harry for his many courtesies, quote unquote. She told him, I am proud that our government is represented in its foreign service by a man of your caliber with your humane and cooperative handling of individuals. A famous righteous Gentile, Varian Fry, also worked closely with my father in saving people. According to the David Wyman Institute, Varian Fry, a Harvard-trained classics scholar and foreign affairs journalist, volunteered to travel to Vichy, France to organize an exodus with help from First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. After Fry's arrival, Harry traveled around Vichy, France with him in search of people on Fry's emergency list. On December 29, 1940, Fry and Bingham met with Mark Segal in Bingham's villa to begin planning his escape. Shortly afterwards, Fry escorted Segal to the U.S. consulate in Marseille, where Bingham quickly granted him an immigrant visa, even though the artist 
did not possess the required affidavits. At one point, Bingham and Fry persuaded Marseille police to release Chagall after he was rounded up with other Jews. Bingham and Fry then helped Chagall and his wife Bella escape to America. Chagall's granddaughter, Dr. Bella Meyer, attended the Capitol Hill celebration for Harry Stamp in 2006. She said that he had helped keep Chagall's vision alive, which was to teach others how to listen with their hearts and appreciate the beauty of life. Mark Chagall wrote a letter to Harry from Lisbon in 1941. Dear Mr. Bingham, this is to inform you that we are embarking today for Monsanto, Portugal. This is completely unexpected. The paintings have just arrived and we have just been offered a cabin. I immediately accepted it. We would have liked to see you before our departure. We tried to phone you a number of times and we very much regret having been unable to reach you by phone. We hope to see you again sometime in the future. We are very happy to have met you and become acquainted with you and we will long remember our meetings with you. We both send you our affectionate thoughts. Very sincerely yours, your friend Mark Chagall. Our temporary address is care of Mr. Starr, <coughs> Museum of Modern Art, New York. <laughs> My father greatly admired Mark Chagall's and his colorful dreamlike paintings. Meanwhile, in his office at the consulate, Harry issued as many life-saving visas and affidavits in lieu of passports as he could to exiles whose papers had been confiscated or lost. His forbidden rescue activities occurred during a lonely 14-month separation from his wife and their four children at the time who had been ordered back to the States for safety in mid-1940. The author wrote that Harry sorely missed his family. Harry also visited detention camps in southern France and alerted superiors to the inhumane conditions inside the dying, with dying men, women, and children who were detained for deportation to extermination camps. There is evidence that the Nazis complained to Washington about Harry's and Fry's activities. The U.S. had not yet entered the war and was on the surface a neutral country. In a recorded interview around 1980, Harry told his 13-year-old granddaughter, Tiffany, who was working on a school project, how he had defied his superiors while stationed in Marseille. He told her, my boss said, the Germans are going to win the war. Why should we do anything to offend them? And he didn't want to give any visas to these Jewish people. So in a way, I had to do as much as I could on September 18, 1940, U.S. Secretary of State Cordell Hull sent a stern telegram to the American Embassy in France <coughs> condemning the rescue activities by American citizens who violated the laws of friendly nations. The Secretary's wrath was clearly aimed at Foreign Service Officer Bingham and as well as Fry. At that time they were running the underground rescue operation from Bingham's house, which included planning escapes and hiding refugees there, such as the Foyt Bongus and Thomas Mann's brother and nephew and others. Article 19 of France's armistice agreement with Germany required France to surrender refugees to the Nazis on demand. This meant that refugees were subject to detention in French camps 
until their deportation to extermination camps in Germany and elsewhere in Europe. By issuing as many visas as he could to refugees, Harry Bingham violated Article 19 of the Armistice Law, in quotes. He provided a means of a refugees' escape from Nazi-occupied Europe to freedom. In May 1941, the State Department demoted Bingham from his supervisory role in the visa section and abruptly transferred him to Lisbon, Portugal, and then Buenos Aires, Argentina, far from the European theater. When Barry and Fry learned that Bingham was packing his things to leave Marseille, he wrote in his May 1941 diary, Harry Bingham's going will be a great loss to the refugees and may seriously cripple our work. Years later, Fry presented Harry with his book, Surrender on Demand, bearing the handwritten inscription to my partner in the crime of saving human lives. While in Argentina, Harry alerted the State Department of the spread of fascism in the Southern Hemisphere, but he had sealed his fate. He continued to be bypassed for promotions and unhappily resigned from the Foreign Service in 1945. He brought his family to the farmhouse in Salem where he remained until he died in 1988. Like other righteous diplomats, my father brought his World War II <coughs> secrets to the grave. The first inkling I had that he was considered a Holocaust rescuer was in 1993 when the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum invited my parents to attend a huge tri tribute to World War II rescuers in the amphitheater of the Arlington National Cemetery. My father was no longer alive and Rose was too frail to make the trip. So she invited my sister Abigail and me to use the tickets. It was a very memorable celebration on a beautiful sunny day. In April 1998, Harry was honored with 10 other righteous diplomats in a Yad Vashem exhibit in Jerusalem during Israel's 50th anniversary. I was privileged to attend with two brothers, David and William, at the invitation of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Also attending the exhibit were families of the righteous diplomats, including Mrs. Sugihara, widow of famous Japanese rescuer Shayun Sugihara, and Raoul Wallenberg's niece Louise, and the friendly children of 10 other diplomats were all present. Harry Bingham was the only American diplomat featured in the Yad Vashem exhibit. During our bus tour of Israel, we met a number of Holocaust survivors and heard their moving stories of escape from the Holocaust. They expressed profound gratitude for the life-saving activities of the World War II diplomats. We planted pine trees in memory of the 11 diplomats being honored during a televised ceremony in the beautiful Sugihara forest overlooking Jerusalem. This emotional tour inspired me to launch the stamp drive for my father in 1998, December. Each year, the U.S. Postal Service politely wrote to me that the stamp proposal remains under consideration. Then one year, I received a letter from the Postal Service stating that the proposal remains under serious consideration. <laughs> the stamp drive also caught the attention of Secretary of State Colin Powell, who in June 2002 invited Harry's children 
to the State Department for a constructive dissent award ceremony. In his speech before a number of Foreign Service officers, Powell stated that the Harry Bingham had placed his life and career on the line doing the right thing. This was a welcome first time State Department tribute to Harry 14 years after he died. The stamp campaign was exciting not only because of the broad bipartisan support received, but also because of beautiful emails sent by Harry's survivors. In June 2008, Lawrence Bodner wrote that his father Jack, at age 17, escaped with Harry's help, and, and he wrote a letter to, to, her, to me. Your father issued my dad's visa on February 27, 1940. My father sailed on March 30, 1940 on the SS Champlain. The day of the sailing, the police brought my father to your dad's office in leg irons, handcuffs, and in prison guard. My dad did not have a shower in more than three weeks. Your father was enraged. Your dad ordered the police to remove the leg irons and handcuffs and then ordered his secretary to take my father for a bath and to buy him new clothes before your dad could take him to the ship. Your father knew what my dad had gone through. My dad was just 17 years old when he was arrested and imprisoned in the concentration camp. I thought that I should share my dad's story with you. Since your father was responsible for the survival of my father and in turn was indirectly responsible for the creation of me, my two brothers, my two sisters, ten grandchildren and four great-grandchildren, I would like to honor your father by sending you a copy of my book, Respectfully Lawrence Bodner. Now, we already heard from survivor Earl Ellie Sherman on the film, and she, I'm going to repeat her email to me in October of 2005. She was an elderly California lady who sent the following email. Of the three in my family whom your father saved, I am the last one alive, and I write this with trembling fingers and many a tear. Without him, we would not have been able to avoid the concentration camp to which we were assigned two days later. Your father provided us with documents because we no longer held citizenship in any country and therefore had no papers. We cannot honor him enough. Sincerely, Ellie Sherman. She also sent me copies of her family visas, which my father had signed in 1941 when she was 15. I was thrilled to recognize his signatures. These visas are uh, displayed on, on my website. In a happy coincidence, in October 2009, Harvard Dean Michael Chenegal was teaching English literature to my daughter Alexandra. One day he took her aside after class and they tearfully discovered that her grandfather had saved his family in the spring of 1941. The dean emailed me saying my family is indebted to your father for saving our lives. Survivor Joseph Schachter is a rabbi living in Jerusalem. In 1941, his entire family, six people in all, received visas from Harry. Every year on January 12th, the date of my father's death, we receive an email from Rabbi Joseph. On that day, he lights a candle in Harry's memory 
He tells his children, were it not for Harry Bingham, I would not be here to light this, nor would you. Now he has many grandchildren and great-grandchildren. In conclusion, I hope the story of Hiram Bingham IV and the other World War II righteous diplomats will inspire people to stand up to evil in the world and strive to make our world a more humane and loving place. Thank you very much. I'm amazed that he survived as long as he did issuing these visas and that the State Department didn't somehow try to counter the effect of them by denying their validity when the people got to the States. Can you share, I mean, how did he ever keep doing this for, what, 18 months or something like that? That's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure why there was no official earlier action. There was plenty of waiting for him to be uh, to get a promotion. I know that he was very unhappy uh, every time he was passed over, even when he was in Buenos Aires, uh, far from the, the European theater. So he had to resign uh, before his retirement. And uh, he raised all of 11 children in Salem and put us all in very good schools and uh, when he died, he was land poor, basically. Any any other questions? Yes. There was a book, probably in the middle 70s, and I think it was written by a professor at Trinity College, locally, uh, about a town in the south of France that it Jews that were written. Do you know anything about that book? I think there was a town, yes, that uh, took in refugees, and um, they have been honored, but the name doesn't escape me. Yes. Your brother, uh, Tony, who I knew pretty well, Hiram Bingham, the fifth, I guess, told yes. me that when you were in Buenos Aires, your father got into a lot, a lot of trouble exposing what the Germans were doing in Argentina and got a lot of criticism from the State Department for that. Do you remember anything about that? Well, all I know is that uh, he didn't get very good responses from his superiors uh, whenever he complained about about the spread of fascism in South America. I don't know any more details. Yes. <coughs> You mentioned that he went to some of the detention camps in southern France. Yes. Did he write at all about any French persons who had some empathy towards this horrible crisis? Well, he did write up some detailed reports of his visits to the detention facilities in, in southern France. And he, he mentioned all of the inhumane conditions to his bosses, and but he never heard back up from up the chain. He, he didn't hear any response to his reports that he put together on his own expense. Uh, and uh, yes, go ahead, sir. Did you ever get any cooperation from the State Department now or in, in these years concerning your father's paper? The State Department uh, has been videoing uh, events surrounding honoring my father and has that in teaching program, as I understand, about standing up to evil. And uh, so that, that may be current. Also, uh, there's a museum that has just been established 
in Washington, D.C., called the United States Diplomacy Center. And I've been told that one of my interviews will be shown at that museum when it's when they're done with it. I think they've, they're pretty close to having finished this museum called the United States Diplomacy Center, as I understand it. But that can be Google searched, and you can see where they've come to it at this point. My wife is answering that she knows a little more. <laughs> And why don't you come up here and, and <laughs> I, I don't know if you're convincing or what. <laughs> no, I, I was just going to say that all of the papers um, will, will undoubtedly have been declassified and will be available in this museum when it's completed. Oh, any, yes. yes. You mentioned that Eleanor Roosevelt uh, went to France to what? To well, the, uh, I said that she had sent the Waitsdale couple, the Sharps, and they were sent by Eleanor Roosevelt. I don't think she went in person over there. But, but this is sort of an opposition to Franklin. Well, uh, I'm not, uh, I think they understood one another, I suppose. <laughs> yes. Can you shed a little more light on how you found these papers? I got the sense that he died without really talking to anybody in the family. That's um, a good question, right. We, first of all, when we were at the exhibit in uh, the Yad Vashem, I went with David and my brother William, the diplomats there said, all of the families that we got to meet, they were not aware of their father's actions, just like in my family. Uh, and they, they realized, and it was kind of a consensus, that it was a dark period in their personal lives, not only for everyone else, uh, the time of the Holocaust. So they, they it's not a good period to go back to in, in their memories. And um, I know that they must have been very upset that they couldn't get more, give more freedom to more people. They, they had limited abilities working where they did. Yes? Ken, could you tell us about the discovery of papers Yes, that's a, that's a good question. The, the second part of the question is where did the evidence come from? Yes. Well, we, my brother Bill found some behind the fireplace on the second floor. Uh, my sister Abigail found some on the, in the basement and in the attic of the house. And at one point about 20 years ago, we had restored the house. so. Everything had been taken out and then put back in, and we're not sure if my father had placed the documents where we found them, but anyway, they were, it was exciting all the time to find these. So it's sort of documents. true that you found some of these in the wall? <laughs> That's true. It, it was a nice wraparound closet behind mm. a chimney. The house was built in 1769, and there were uh, seven fireplaces in there. And one of them had this wraparound closet where it was always warm for bread, I think, keeping it warm or something like that. <laughs> and any other question? Yes. And what, were the nature, what was the nature of the papers that, that remained that he kept? Well, they, they detailed um, the experience of my father in Marseille in his activities. Uh, and my book explains what documents we got and where. And uh, any any further issues, questions? I think I read a that uh, 
when your father was in foreign service, he was doing some Nazi hunting. Well, he was sending reports of what he <coughs> had observed going on uh, down there. He was in the U.S. Embassy, I think, as the first secretary at that time. But it was reports of actions going on. Yes. In, in 1945, when the full extent of the Holocaust was known, when we knew about the extermination of the Jews, was there any recognition by the State Department that they had made a mistake? That, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing. No, I can't uh, say anything more than you can. <coughs> yes. Well, thank you all very much, and I think.